Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Fred and Lou Hartwig family, Peter and Barbara Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. In addition to roast and toast, our topics this week, Democrats turn to impeachment as they try again to dump Trump. Kansas City Star will dump its Saturday print edition and what may be the shortest retirement in history. And that's where we start with our newsmaker segment as we welcome Kansas City, Missouri City Manager Troy Schulte, who has announced he will retire when his contract ends early next year. Schulte has spent about 10 years as city manager working with Mayors Funkhauser, James, and now Lucas. Not long after the retirement was announced, speculation began that Schulte was not actually going into full-fledged retirement. Instead, he was joining Jackson County government as the county administrator. Final action on that appointment expected early next week. And joining us to talk about all that is City Manager Troy Schulte. Mr. Schulte, welcome back to Ruckus. Good to be here, Mike. Thanks for inviting Con me. Congratulations on your retirement. Yep, short-lived apparently. Congratulations yep. on your almost new job. Thank you. Thank you. So how did this potential job at Jackson County come about? Did you approach the county? Did the county approach you? Uh, I, as soon as I announced that I was uh, planning on leaving Kansas City, I got a call literally the next day from uh, Jackson County, uh, the, the Jackson County Executive Frank White. and. Uh, asked to kind of meet and see if there was a role that I could uh, assist them in trying to move their agenda forward over at the county. It was a conversation that started and was amicable and uh, kind of just moved from there over the last couple of weeks. Well, I believe this past Monday was when the legislature was expected to approve the contract and there has been a delay. What caused that? I think the legislature uh, had some good questions about making sure that they were comfortable with the kind of the new org chart, the organization chart that the county will be using, because um, I would be stepping in and kind of running day-to-day -day operations for county government. Uh, so they wanted to see that, and then they kind of wanted to see uh, maybe a job description as a county administrator, although they've had a chief administrative officer in the past. Uh, they kind of wanted to see the revised job descriptions. All good, and, all good questions, and well, tr hopefully the county gets them the information. And they can move. So, forward. who would you report to? The county executive. I would report to the county executive, and then I would also have reporting responsibilities out to the county legislature as well. Obviously, you weren't particularly ready to retire, considering the fact you're going to retire and then go to right. work. So, could we assume that if the current mayor had not been elected, you would not have retired? No, I. I think I was probably ready to do something else. Uh, I, I had been in there 10 years as city manager, which is, uh, we would jokingly say, was about 70 years in dog years. And, uh, you know, I had, I had gotten most of my to-do list done. Uh, the financial position of the city is as strong as it's ever been. We've got infrastructure funding and we've got the major projects such as the airport, infrastructure planning, streetcar, all underway or completed. So it was a good time. And most of my senior team was beginning to retire legitimately because they were had been there for a number of years. So I was looking for a kind of a complete turnover of my staff as well as uh, kind of my completion of what I'd set out to do. So I thought it was a good time to step aside and let Mayor uh, Lucas get his own team in place and move forward the way they wanted it. So if you get this job in Jackson County, do you have a list of priorities? I've got uh, several and they seem to always keep adding to the to the list. We've got to obviously work on the assessment process for 2021. Uh, we've got to deal with the correctional facility. Uh, we've got to deal with the uh, uh, facilities. The courthouse has had some serious structural issues. There's a plan out there. We just need to implement it. We've got to try to figure out a path forward on this Rock Island uh, rail uh, project. There's innumerable other projects that will probably float to the surface. We've got a compensation uh, program for county employees who are woefully underpaid. Uh, and it's been that way for a long time. So we've got to get that implemented and make sure we treat our people right. So there's plenty of, no shortage of stuff to do over but, the county. But you wouldn't be woefully underpaid, would you? No, I'm, I am taking the same salary I had at Kansas City and I'm going to take it over at Jackson County. What do you consider your greatest success during your years as city manager? Uh, I think, I think a couple of things, uh, again, kind of restoring the financial position and then I think hopefully kind of restoring uh, some 
maybe the public faith that the government, the city government can deliver on what it says. I think that shows a track record with our elections. There was confidence that if we asked the voters for a bond program, it would, the infrastructure would be uh, built, the airport, uh, the park sales tax, that we, when we set out to do something, we can deliver. And I think that's been the, the, the big takeaway from our tenure is I think uh, unlike maybe some of the issues you're seeing at the federal government and the state government, I think we've proven that local government still works and can be very effective in making the region and the city a much better place. Let me ask you a final quick question. We often hear from people on Ruckus, Kansas City is taxed too much compared to peer cities. Do you agree? I do not. I think we are taxed. We are a high tax city. But if you look at some of the more successful cities in the country, uh, Minneapolis, uh, Seattle, or Portland, those are all tax efforts. I think if you, as long as you're getting quality for it, I think we have to be judicious in how we use taxes and ask for taxes. Uh, but I don't think we're overtaxed. I think we get value. We're a large city, 317 square miles, and only 480,000 people in it. We're bigger than the city of New York and only about a tenth of the population. So. Density, the lack of density creates some fiscal issues. Got to stop you there. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, congratulations on the new job. Look forward to seeing you again. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Mike. That is Kansas City, Missouri City Manager Troy Schulte. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Alana Rately is the executive director of the 19th Amendment Centennial Celebration. Sean Saving is a labor activist, part of the Heartland Labor Forum at KKFI Radio. Teresa Garza is a former Jackson County legislator. Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Welcome back to all of you. Thanks for joining us. Let us start with some thoughts about what we just discussed with Troy Schulte. Schulte was city manager for about 10 years, starting with Mayor Mark Funkhauser, spending a couple of terms with Sly James, and finally what will be a few months with Quentin Lucas at the helm. As we heard, Schulte is expected to join Jackson County government as the administrator at a salary of $220,000 per year plus perks that will surely warm the hearts of people who saw large hikes in their property tax assessments. No doubt, however, the county's problems are wide-ranging from property tax inflation to jailhouse consternation, and it's going to take major management talent to solve them. So do you think Schulte's time wrestling with city issues prepares him to take on the massive problems facing Jackson County? We'll start with a former Jackson County legislator, Teresa Garza. Uh, absolutely. I think it's a great move for the county to bring him on board. It's long overdue in regards to the county having somebody in that type of a position that can handle such difficult and diverse complications and problems. I mean, the county, as we all know, has been entrenched for years in issues. And so it's good to bring somebody on that can actually handle them, that has dealt with them, that has um, kind of navigated through different political uh, mindsets and has been able to still do a good job. From what you hear, do you have any doubts that the legislature will approve a contract with uh, Schulte? Not that I'm aware of. I think that it will go through. I think working out the details as they indicated this previous Monday in their legislative uh, meeting is important. Uh, one thing at the county, and I can say this from being there, is like even when I came on board there, they didn't even have a job description for like a legislative aide. So that's just something that doesn't even shock me or surprise me when it comes to Jackson County. And so the fact that they want a job description makes a lot of sense to me. So if Jackson County hires Schulte, this will be a benefit politically, wouldn't you think, for Frank White, who's had a lot of difficulty? Well, I think so. Look, the, uh, I didn't agree with everything Mr. Schulte said about the city's finances, nonetheless. <laughs> the reputation of the city hall in Kansas City right now, uh, among just people in general, I think is pretty high. S the reputation of Jackson County government, <laughs> not so high. Correct. And so they obviously, to bring somebody over from a place people think well of to a place they're worried about, makes sense. Sean, yeah. do you think there'll be a power struggle once Schulte gets there between the long entrenched forces and, and this guy who's going to be in control? I'm sure there will be. I mean, it just depends on how this job description uh, lays out. The question is going to be, he's reporting to Frank White, but he also has to report to the legislature. Is he going to be serving Kind of like he bosses? did a city manager Correct. reporting to the so mayor. He, and so he has experience trying to do with that, deal with that. So if, if you know, if it well, let's see. Alana, he's going to earn, if he's hired, $220,000 plus perks, mm -hmm. uh, car and some other benefits. Uh, given all this controversy about high taxes, do you think people in Jackson County will resent the hiring of a, an administrator at that salary? 
I think it all depends on the messaging and how they um, how they couch it. So, if they go on and say he is taking over a job that encompasses three other jobs that two were not filling in addition to this one, I think it pays for itself, and that can be Correct. that can be communicated that way. Um, and the, on the other hand, though, he is making significantly more than his boss, so I think there might be a little bit of questioning around that. I, I didn't get a chance to ask him, but I think I, I've heard and read that he might leave City Hall before his retirement takes place in February. Uh, what should the city do about finding a successor for Troy Schulte as manager? I think that's a great question. He has that's also, why though, I, asked it. I mean, I, I read it. <laughs> that is true. So I, I did read the same thing, but also at the same time, I, 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 he also indicated that he would like to finish out his contract. So I don't know. I think that's going to be determined on what is moved forward by the legislative body and the county executive in their agreement of his contract. If you had to pick one achievement of Troy Schulte doing his years as manager, what would you pick? I mean, and even though Woody disagrees, I think the financial stability of the city compared to where it was under like Funkhauser is vastly different. I mean, you can see that. Um, you can also see the benefits of what that has entailed across the KC metro area. Sean, would you pick anything in particular? What about KCI? I, you know, the, the, the KCI thing, I think, is a they, they, it, it, took, it was a rough start, but I think they've finally started to get things straightened out there. I think there's a lot of questions, though, about the contracting and who's being hired to do what uh, and the work. They're, they're not meeting some of the goals they claimed. Uh, Whether well, that's his responsibility or not, I don't know. And when it's going to be finished, I looked at an interview with Schulte two or three years ago, I did, and he was talking about KCI being finished in 2021. It's now 2023. <laughs> At well, this moment. And every time they put the date back, the price <laughs> yeah. goes up. Yeah. Exactly. The price goes Other up. All right, we'll move ahead. The Kansas City Star newspaper is one of 29 owned by the McClatchy Corporation based in Sacramento. There are locals who swear by the star and just as many who swear at the star. <laughs> Paper has undergone many changes over its long history. Some of us recall the days when there was not just the star, but the co-owned Kansas City Times. The Times was the morning paper, the Star the evening edition. Now there's just the Star once a day. And starting next year, there will be no Saturday print edition of the Star, a decision coming from McClatchy headquarters. While I am confident your lifestyle will not be impeded by this change, Woody, what is the story behind it? I bet it won't. Uh, well, look. It, it, you look at the financial articles about McClatchy and you don't know where to start. Clearly, they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. Next year, they have a $120 million pension funding obligation. Now, they're already 500 and some million in the hole on this pension. Uh, they're talking, they're trying to lobby in Congress to, to reduce that minimum payment they have to make. Well, that doesn't alter the fact that if you're going to make the pension payments, you've got to put that much money in. Congress can say the, the tide shall not come in, but the tide comes in. And so it's just that's preposterous. Then they can dump it on the PGBC, the Pension yeah. Guarantee Benefit yeah. Corporation, us. which is us. <laughs> yeah. And clearly, when they said, and they said, we don't know how, where the money will come from to fund that $120 million, that means their lenders aren't going to lend it to them, and there's no buyer prepared to purchase if he has to go on funding the pension. Mm -hmm. So what the buyers are saying, if there are any, is dump this to the PGBC, and then we'll talk about making a purchase. Well, and they're yeah. not going to they're not going to lend to him anyway because I mean, it's such a high risk. I mean, it's too high of a risk. Sure. The well, lending get, getting a loan is just not even One last thing. Plausible. Gannett has Gannett the biggest right. and McClatchy between them 280 papers. Mm -hmm. 10 million circulation. That's about 35,000 people per paper. Yeah. Nobody's and that's circulation not right. readership. Yeah. And why would you advertise for Nobody reads. Well, people aren't reading really necessarily mm -hmm. newspapers anymore. They're getting right. their news from so many other well, sources. Well, they're, they're, on, they're digital. on a digital, <laughs> and they, yeah, and they have to subscribe to the Star to get access to right. the digital edition. Which they didn't even start doing until, mm -hmm. uh, you know, too late yeah, in the but game. But well, the digital ad revenue is down. Uh, yeah. If there were a different owner for the Kansas City Star, would it make any difference? Would it make <laughs> things better? I don't think so. I think, you know, it's seen as such a... a a partisan uh, publication that people, Republicans, have left for years, um, and those are maybe the people that swear at it, but um, they've left for years, and as it gets more and more partisan, um, people in the middle are kind of 
um, discouraged from doing from reading it as well. It just sometimes seems like it's even propaganda, uh, which well, I uh, find it like I don't think the star is like <laughs> partisan at all. Do you, do you ever read as the, a former Jacksonville legislator, do you ever read, the, the, you you ever read the editorial page? I'm talking about the editorial, the editorial page. Oh. Yeah, but that's opinion. I mean, right, no. but. And, and but, it's been that way for a long time. That's not not new at the Kansas correct. Star. I would like to see somebody, paper. you know, like the Koch <laughs> brothers, offer to buy this paper for more than its value, and I'm betting they wouldn't sell to them. Uh, Sean, do we need a daily paper in Kansas City? Of, of course. course. Dispatch wouldn't. This is, I mean, a city this size has to have a daily newspaper, and the Star is, you know, it's it's. it's Created its own problems. It's it's cut so much back. I realize mm -hmm. there are financial reasons to do it, but then you start to cut the reasons people read the paper. Right. right. You get rid of all the people covering the things you need to cover, and then I don't read the paper because there's nothing in the Star on a regular basis that's worth reading. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because we live in a time now of unprecedented local corruption because we have, don't have local papers covering the basic functions of government. And business. It's and like so, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And so we've got all this coverage of national news and almost nothing about local news. Why does McClatchy have a national office in Washington? What do we need that for? Exactly. Why, why don't they pull those guys back Kansas City and have them cover City Hall? Mm -hmm. Right. Are, are other That's newspapers great. having problems? Across yes. the board, yes. Oh, yeah. How about the New York Times? It's not having any problems, is it? Even though the president says it's failing. The readership, I think, is, is, down. The readership is still down, I think, across the board. I think digital, their digital is, is up. The only newspapers that are doing, um, are kind of holding and treading water are the ones that are able to increase their digital, digital readership. readership yes. well, Aren't we seeing all sorts of changes in media in America, not just newspapers, sure. but Correct. television? Radio, yeah. everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, you know, there's a paper up near Scranton uh, that covers a whole river valley of several towns up there, and they're hiring people, and they do an intense coverage of everything local, your yeah. kids' mm -hmm. football and game, the mm -hmm. band, there, everything. There are studies that show that interest rates are lower in areas where you have local news coverage because you have better accountability and mm -hmm. more trust in governance and local business. And the, the, the studies have been done. It's, there, are, there are actual financial benefits to having good local news coverage. And when the Star was healthier, it used to have coverage of the entire metropolitan area. Exactly. You'd have Correct. a sense of what right. was going on in areas other than where you live. Correct. I don't think that exists anymore. At it least I don't not. see it. It does, it does not. not. All right. Too bad. Impeaching the president by the U.S. House is a rare event in American history. Thus far, only two presidents have been, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. Richard Nixon would have been, but resigned before the vote. Now there may be a third, Donald J. Trump. Being impeached is like being charged with a crime. It's not a conviction. If the president is impeached, his future will be decided by a vote of the U.S. Senate after a trial presided over by the Chief Justice of the United States. If convicted, Trump would leave office and Mike Pence would become president. While no one knows for sure what will happen, and I emphasize that over and over, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. The general consensus seems to be this. The House controlled by Democrats will impeach. The Senate controlled by Republicans will not convict. Trump will stay as president at least until the election is decided and the next term begins. So is there a point to the current impeachment process? And if so, what is it? We'll go first to Alana, then to Sean. Sure. I think um, there is a point, and the point is to for Democrats to get back at Trump for winning the election last time. They have tried to impeach him since the day he became elected. And so the whole point of this is to discredit him. And because they're not able to get him out right now, they're trying to discredit him for the next election. So this has just been a continuous process of one, one witch hunt to the next. And that is the point for Democrats. We know that he's not going to be impeached because the Senate will not impeach him. So, you know, again, the point is they don't have anything to run on. So, again, they're running on the anti-Trump vote. Uh, so, Sean, is there a point to this? And if so, yeah, what is it? Of course there's a point to it. There's a constitutional responsibility to investigate. If you, don't, if you don't investigate and do this impeachment, what is the Congress supposed to do? These are evidences of high crimes and misdemeanors and, and more. And, then, and, there's, and it's not just this. There's a whole long line of things this president has done. But the other thing is, the Sen there is, there is a possibility. The Senate can set its own rules for the vote. Three senators of Republicans could say, we want a private vote on impeachment. And currently, Jeff Flake, a former senator, and a current Republican senator who's not been named, have said that there are at least 30 votes for impeachment if it's a private vote. 
So I don't think it's a done deal. Teresa? I don't think it's a done deal either. <laughs> you don't? You think there's a chance the Republicans would convict uh, Donald Trump I, if I, it gets to the Senate? I think it goes to Sean's point about a private vote. I think that changes the dynamics. Uh, um, uh, how would the public react to a private vote yeah. in the U.S. Senate on impeachment? A Surely revolution? that would be causing an outrage. Yes. It might cause, it, cause an outrage. Uh, I hope it would cause if, a revolution. If, I think what, that's a little extreme. What, what if McConnell <laughs> chose not to have a vote, just had the vote of whether to proceed or not? In the That's a possibility too, yeah. you know. I, I think he said at one point there's an obligation that. to yeah. hold yeah. a trial yeah. because right. of the Constitution. Uh, if there's an obligation to hold a trial on the part of a public official who's elected, there is, by all that's holy, an obligation to cast your vote in public so the people who elect you can decide whether to re-elect you. And if they don't do that, they're despicable. Uh, I will say this: Look, impeach has two meanings. This has been decided on both meanings. They've already decided they're going to impeach the president. So that the other sense of impeach is to attack someone's credibility or truthfulness. Adam Schiff has impeached himself irretrievably. Let me ask you this, uh, Teresa. Hmm. Will being impeached but not convicted affect how Republicans see Donald Trump when he runs for re-election in 2020? No. It won't, it won't have any, I don't think it'll have any impact. Uh, Alana, do you whatsoever. see this impeachment process as being Mueller 2.0? Uh, yes. A continuation of the Russian investigation? Absolutely. I mean, after this is over, who knows what will come up next? Nothing surprises me anymore. Money laundering and financial crimes, that's what's next on the docket. <laughs> sure, we all know right. it. The data's out there. Well, the well, Sean, there. Okay, it, but there's no proof. The Ukrainian president did not feel pressured. They yes, he did. Are you listening? Sean, hang on a second. Yesterday knew. Hang on. They knew. He also said that he, um, they did not know that that aid was going to be taken away, and the aid was given back. Two days after the announcement of the whistleblower's report. Did they, you see who made The testimony was all made yesterday, then in fact, their email, they knew on the day of the call, in fact, that the, the, the Ukrainians knew something was up. Woody, how so serious is it? Mr. Trump delivered both the things he supposedly would deliver. Yeah. They delivered neither of the things they were supposedly going to deliver they got caught. and were told this is a quid pro quo. There's a quid, there's no pro, and there's no quo. You get your hand in the cookie jar, you get caught with it and go, hey, hey I dropped drop, the cookie. Nope, yep. No crime. Not me. That <laughs> is, then you didn't steal a cookie. <laughs> Sean, right. what high crime, crime is still a crime. Sean, what high crime and or misdemeanor would you say is now before the House to impeach well, it was obstruction the of justice, first of all. Which is what? The fact that they're not, re they're refusing to turn for any of the documents, there's intimi which, witness intimidation. They're, they're claiming executive privilege. That does exist, does it not? Right. A House impeachment proceeding is not a proceeding by the justice system of the United States. How can you obstruct justice in a political proceeding? Which they tried to do last the, the time. Fact that the call I think that was one of the impeachment service. charges against Nixon, wasn't it, that didn't get voted on was uh, obstruction, obstruction of justice. Obstruction of justice. That was it was one of the charges that wasn't voted on. Sorry, you can't obstruct but, justice but, in a political like your, your cookie jar analogy, okay, that's like saying somebody breaks into your house and you come home at the same time and they run out the back door. That's still a crime still that was crime. committed. They broke in. That is, still it's a still crime. a crime. They broke Trying in. Trying to break in is no. also a crime. They, even if they didn't take so anything. So now you're back to knowing his motives for this. And that's what you have to prove, and that's very so, nearly impossible. Okay, I got to stop there <laughs> because we're running out of time. I do want to tell you, you that the first <laughs> impeachment trial of Andrew Johnson, which of course I covered, uh, was decided <laughs> by one vote. It was Senator Edmund Ross from Kansas, and no one to this day knows why he chose to not vote to impeach. And I forgot to do something very important here. You'll see it on the screen. You can read it for yourself. It's about how people are being affected by this. And now it is time for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckettes have 30 seconds each to evaluate, obliterate, or obfuscate. And up first is Woody. Well, I just changed mine. My toast is to Senator Edmund Ross of Kansas, <laughs> who, unlike Adam Schiff, understands that impeaching a president who has been duly elected on the Constitution, especially after you've demonstrated from day one before you, he did anything, that you wanted to destroy his presidency, is actually a serious matter under the Constitution. And n no Democrat in the House thus far has evinced any notion of that. Alana. So my toast this week goes out to New York Congresswoman 
Elise Stefanik um, on the House Intelligence Committee and her role in the impeachment hearings. Stefanik made it clear that while she doesn't always agree with the president, he has done nothing impeachable. She is an excellent example for lawmakers as well as constituents who need a lesson in telling the truth, even about someone they don't always fall in line with. I don't always agree with Stefanik on things, but I do agree that we all need to look at things fairly and stop wasting taxpayer money on fishing expeditions. All right, Teresa. So I'm going to step away from the impeachment issue. <laughs> and I actually want to toast um, all of the sponsors, the organizations, and the entrepreneurs that have been involved with the Global Entrepreneur Work uh, Week this year. Week in Kansas City. It's been going on since Monday. It's still going on. There's been some great sessions. A lot of people have put a lot of time and energy into it, and it's been a wonderful experience. Sean. Previously on this show, I've pointed out that the president's top advisor on immigration policy, Stephen Miller, is a racist. Though this has been no secret to those willing to pay attention, Mr. Miller's allies have continued to defend him, claiming he is just a victim of political correctness. Emails released this week between Mr. Miller and Breitbart News reveal that he is not just an ignorant bigot, but a full-blown believer in white nationalist mythologies and hate. He has no business in our government, let alone advising on our immigration policy. He should be fired immediately. You're not a supporter, I take it. <laughs> and finally, a New York state lawmaker from Brooklyn has introduced legislation that, if passed, would allow prisoners to vote next November. In the unlikely event this becomes law, how could prisoners behind bars vote? Maybe the answer is simple. They will simply use cell phones. And that is Ruckus for this week. We're away for a while, making room for special programming and critical fundraising activities. Now for the Ruckus and crew, Mike Shannon saying happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for watching and good night.